Undoubtedly, one of the best stories in literature is to be found in our Bible, and that's the story of Noah and the ark. I think even our children learn this at a very early age. However, looking to kind of spin this a little different way, I decided to go on the internet. Sometimes that's a good thing, sometimes it's bad. But I found a rather modern version of the story of Noah and the ark, and I thought it was pretty good, and I wanted to share it with you today because I think it really reflects some of our current understandings. And this is an abbreviated version. The Lord spoke to Noah and said, Noah, in six months I'm going to make it rain until the whole world is covered with water. But I want to save a few good people and two of every living thing on this planet, so I'm ordering you to build an ark. Okay, Noah said, trembling with fear, I'm your man. Well, six months passed, the sky began to cloud up and the rain began to fall in torrents. And the Lord looked down and saw Noah sitting in his yard and there was no ark. Noah shouted the Lord, where is my ark? Lord, please forgive me, begged Noah. I did my best, but there were some really big problems. First, I had to get a building permit. <laughs> my neighbors objected, claiming that I was violating zoning ordinances by building something so big in my front yard. So I spent months trying to get a variance from the city planning board. After all that, I had a problem with getting enough wood for the ark because of the protected forest wilderness. Well, then the carpenters union picketed my home because I wasn't union, using union help. <laughs> Next, I started gathering up the animals, but I got sued by an animal rights group. <laughs> and just as that suit got dismissed, here comes the EPA and notifies me that I couldn't complete the ark without filing an environmental impact statement for your proposed flood. <laughs> Well, then the Corps of Engineers wanted a map of the area that was going to be flooded. And so when I gave them a globe of the earth, they went ballistic. <laughs> Lord, I'm so sorry, but I don't think there's any way I can finish the ark in less than five years, if ever. Well, with that, the sky cleared up, the sun began to shine, and a rainbow arched across the sky. Noah looked up and he smiled. You mean you're not going to destroy the world, he asked, hopefully. Wrong, thundered the Lord. But I'm going to do it with something far worse than a flood. Something far more destructive. Something that man himself has created. What is that, asked Noah. And the Lord said, government. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I think even little children, like I said at the very beginning, know the story of Noah and the ark and the animals. That's kind of one of the premier stories that you learn in Sunday school or vacation Bible school. And of course, we know the beautiful ending to this story. God made a promise to Noah and to all humankind. Never again would God send a flood to destroy the earth. And this would be a sign of God's promise that there would be a rainbow in the clouds. So whenever we see a rainbow, we are to remember God's promise. One of the most enduring and endearing stories of the Bible. Again, one we gladly teach our children. But stop and think about it. At the heart of this story is violence. Think about it. God finally gets ticked off with all that is happening on the earth and decides that a flood is in order. Now, I don't know about each and every one of you, but I personally have experienced firsthand what a real flood can do. I've lived in South Texas. It doesn't make for cute Sunday school art or stories. Floods can kill people without respect. They can ruin homes and they can destroy lives. So there's nothing cute or sweet about a flood. 
And apparently it didn't take very long for God to get so fed up with his created world that God decided to end it all with a flood. The first two chapters of the book of Genesis record the creation of the world. God declares at the end that his world is to be very good. And God then gives the keys of his new earthly kingdom to his human creation. But by chapter 6, it's already going downhill. And the Lord saw that the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was continually evil. And God said, I'm sorry I made them. Well, then in chapter 7, God decides to do something about it. Human sinfulness has gotten so bad that God decides he's going to have to start over. God is sorry that this world has been created. And so in anger and regret, God brings down the rain. And except for Noah and his family and the animals he's managed to save on the ark, all is gone. Every last thing. Now, I think if we really understood the implications of this story, maybe we wouldn't want to tell it to our children. But I think it's an appropriate story for us to remember as we begin our 40-day journey through this Lenten season. This is as good a time as any for us to now confront our sins and to confess our guilt. It is a season in which we should ask if anything we have done would want to make God start all over again. God established a covenant with humanity after this flood, and we are the inheritors of that covenant. As descendants of Noah, we share in all of the benefits of this relationship which God has established with God's children. But my friends, I think God is still disappointed in us. But there's really some irony in this story of Noah. Why did God decide to save Noah, this one man? Well, the Bible tells us that he was apparently the only righteous man that was left in the world. Yet after the water subsided and after he left the ark, what does Noah do? He falls into a sin so great that it would have brought God's wrath in any other circumstances. God chose the only righteous man on earth, and that man turned out to be not very righteous at all. Somebody asked me after the early service, so what was it that Noah did that was so bad? And if you want to find out, you need to go to the book of Genesis and find out. It's really kind of funny in a way, but not so. The bottom line is Noah's story really is our story. Even at our best, we're not all that God has created us to be. None of us uses all of our potential and our abilities in a constructive way. We're really not the mothers and the fathers or the sons and the daughters or the citizens of this nation or the members of this church or the clergy. We're not the disciples of Christ that we should be. We all fall short of the mark. But God made a promise to Noah and to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. In fact, God made a lot of promises and covenants in the Bible. In fact, if you were to count them all through the Old Testament, through the New Testament, there's more than 3,000 promises that have been given in the Bible. Promises and covenants are therefore very important to God, just as they should be important to us. In this season of the church year, in this Lenten season, you're going to hear a lot of words like grace and love and covenant. And they all come together to point to the one who is the full and final embodiment of God's redemptive covenant. The only true, righteous, and perfect person who walked on this earth. God waited patiently. And then God sent his only son. That is the new covenant. So may we give thanks to God in God's great and eternal patience that he loves us so much that he sent us this new covenant. Amen.